Thank you. Thank you so much, much, Bruce, and everybody at the CCPA for pulling off this evening so flawlessly. Um, I also want to thank the entire Lewis Landsberg family, many of whom are here tonight. Um, I saw Janet Salberg. Um, welcome, Janet, and thank you. I think um, I think I saw Elena. Hey, there's Elena Lewis. And I'm told that Stephen Lewis and Michelle Landsberg are here, so please join me in welcoming them all. <laughs> It, it is such an enormous honor to be part of this initiative, keeping the David Lewis memory alive. Watching those wonderful clips, and I've been watching them over the past couple of days, I was really struck by one thing. Decades before the Vancouver 2010 Olympics, David Lewis owned the podium. <laughs> Did he not? I mean... I mean, he never let the Tories or the Liberals forget whose game it was. <laughs> and these are fighting times we're in. Times when we need to fight for everything we value, to defend every progressive victory. And we would do well to recall the kind of unapologetic confidence, the gloves off naming of names and exposing of interests that helped win those victories in the first place. Not with timidity will we beat back the crowd of small minds and big guns currently running the show in Ottawa, putting our democratic process on ice while they hope that ice hockey will boost their pitiful approval ratings. Now friends, I have to admit, we have now passed the fiery part of the evening. <laughs> Those of you who have seen me speak before know that I tend to keep things at a low simmer. I don't do this, although I want to. Um, David Lewis, even in virtual form, is a tough act to follow. I was prepared for that. I was less prepared for Ovi Lewis being a tough act to follow. Now, as you know, I'm going to be talking about climate debt tonight, and this is a relatively new issue in the global north, one that has received almost no coverage in the mainstream media and only a first glance in the alternative press. Where it did enjoy a brief spotlight recently was in Copenhagen during the Climate Change Summit in December, where it was championed very powerfully by a coalition of Latin American and African governments, as well as a large number of NGOs from the Global South, groups like uh, Focus on the Global South um, and Jubilee South, which has been fighting for the alleviation um, of, of foreign debts for a very long time. So, Given the relative novelty of the subject around these parts, around these cold parts, it makes sense, I suppose, to start with a definition. What is she talking about? At its most basic, climate debt is the idea that poor countries are owed various forms of reparations from rich countries for the climate crisis. It is also the idea that nature has rights including the right to regenerate, and that we have violated those rights and must undertake a process of repairing the earth, a familiar concept. The science underpinning climate debt is familiar to all of you here. The earth's atmosphere has a finite carbon budget, the total amount of carbon that can be emitted by everyone before so much carbon accumulates in the atmosphere that warming becomes catastrophic. A safe level, according to Jim Hansen, the respected NASA scientist, is 350 parts per million. We are already past that and we need to bring it down. We are over our collective carbon budget, overdrawn. But the climate debt argument goes beyond that science and it points out that not everybody is responsible for this. We in the highly industrialized North consumed far more than our share of the global carbon budget. Our actions have created a crisis, a crisis that is global in nature and for which others are paying. For this, we owe a debt on the basic polluter pays principle. But the climate 
debt argument goes further still. It argues that the atmosphere is a common global resource. No country has more right to the global atmosphere than any other. Using the atmosphere as a sink to absorb our emissions benefits countries. It's allowed us to build our profitable industrial economies over the years by using so much more of our than our share of that global carbon budget. We have robbed billions of people of their rightful share, making the price of development much more costly. Now, the bottom line is that we took what wasn't ours, and for that, we owe. It's a difficult truth, but it's true. Climate debt differs in some uncomfortable ways from the ways we are used to talking and thinking about the environment. It's not about polar bears, it's about people. Now, traditionally, North American and European environmentalists have tended to sell climate change as a kind of a kumbaya issue. Unlike so many other issues, this one erases difference. We're all in it together. We all share this fragile blue, blue planet, and that's true, so we all need to work together to save it. Everybody, even Dick Cheney, has grandkids, right? I mean, we've heard these arguments. Now, in sharp contrast, the climate debt movement pointedly stresses difference. It zeroes in on the cruel contrast between those who caused the climate crisis, that would be us in the North, and those who are suffering its worst effects, that's those living in the global South. Now, of course, we will all be affected by climate change in some way or another, but we are not all affected by it in the same way. There are vast differences in the immediacy and in the intensity of the threat. For people in Yemen facing severe water shortages that fuel conflict, or in Bolivia watching their glaciers, their source of drinking water in the capital city of La Paz melt before their eyes, climate change is not about grandchildren, it's about now. By contrast, we appear to be so casual about climate change that we have all kinds of time to waste with denialism, the current media pastime, and too much climate, climate talk, as you, uh, I'm sure, are well prepared for, is bogged down in statistics and jargon, and I promised myself that I would stay away from that tonight. Um, but there are two sets of numbers that we really need to get our heads around in order to understand the urgency of what is fueling this movement, and it is a growing movement. The first set of numbers is this. 20% of the world's population is responsible for 75 to 80 percent of the historical emissions that created the climate crisis. 20 percent responsible for 75 to 80 percent. That 20 percent is us. It's the developed industrialized world, rich countries like Canada. Now, the reason we talk about historical emissions, the amount of countries, the, the amount of carbon countries have emitted since the Industrial Revolution is because carbon stays trapped in the environment. It doesn't just disappear, it stays trapped, growing denser and denser, and it is that density which causes the dangerous levels of warming. So in determining who caused the climate crisis, we can't just look at who emitted what this year or last year or the year before that. We have to take the long view. So that's how we come up with the 20 caused 75 to 80 percent of the damage. Now, the next set of numbers, this comes from Justin Lim, who's the chief economist at the World Bank. And this is a quote, about 75 to 80 percent of the damage caused by global warming will be suffered by developing countries, the majority of the world's population. Now, when you look at these statistics together, what you see is that when it comes to climate change, there is this cruel inverse relationship between cause and effect, an utter disconnect between who has caused the climate crisis and who is living with its worst effects. 